Good morning, everyone, and sorry about the technical issues there. We've had a few uh, glitches with a couple of things that happened while I was scheduled, scheduling the, the presentation. But our internet is going and we're up and live. Unfortunately, I don't have my presentation with me, but what I'm going to do is I will post a similar presentation uh, with my content going forward in the future. And I'm going to take you through a, a presentation and I'm going to guide it on my own, on my own side, but I'm going to take you through a presentation which I've entitled Smart Habits. And the reason I'm involved with the Money Smart Week South Africa each year is I want to really make a difference in how people view their money and how they view the investments. And I want to try and do that using my background, which is a leadership and working with teams and seeing how we can make that work. So really, this is an experiment for me this, this year. I'm trying to do it live, but now I've had a bit of a challenge with uh, the slide. So uh, I'm going to do that, as I said, a little bit later. But let's get going. My title is Smart Habits. And I've, I want you to imagine a bushveld or a very dense forest. And if you can imagine that forest, just think about what it would look like if you're trying to work your way through that forest. Now, I want you to imagine that that forest is your mind or your brain. and You're busy navigating through a complex environment of bushes and shrubs and all sorts of things. It's very dense. And you can't get through that. Ideally, that is the neural pathway of your brain. And we develop neural pathways the more we do something. So if you are a person who loves cycling and you do it every weekend, you participate in a number of events, you build neural pathways, how to stay on your bike, how to drink on your bike while, you, while you're riding, how to navigate various riders. And if you're doing technical off-roading, you develop a neural pathway as if we are developing that pathway through the bushveld. Now, what happens when you can't go through the bushveld? Imagine you've got an expensive car. I, in my presentation, I've got a picture of a Mercedes, and you're trying to get that car through this neural bush or this network of trees and shrubs and bushes. You're going to damage that vehicle. And there's a bit of a challenge because you don't want to damage your vehicle. It costs a lot of money. And imagine that is you trying to navigate a neural pathway where you don't have the the expertise at that stage, you don't have the habits to go through there. And when I talk about smart habits, we're going to look at those aspects of the smart habit. So imagine going through that bush and you've got this expensive Mercedes and you're having to bump against all sorts of branches, trees, shrubs, rocks. What's the car going to look like at the end of that journey? Let me ask the question, will you ever get to the end? of your destination? Will you get to where you want to go? The chances are that you won't. I'm going to hazard a guess and say, not going to work. You're going to write the car off. If you happen to take a mountain bike and the previous day you'd hacked a path through that particular forest, you might stand a better chance of navigating through that dense area. And the more you bush beat that area, you know, chop down, take a, a bigger path. Eventually, you make two tracks. So you've now got a double track running through your brain. That means that you're developing a neural pathway. And the more we do something, the more we develop that neural pathway until you've got a highway running through your brain. Now, you can see a lot of people that you meet have a way of working with figures very, very fast, and they can, they can arrange that they take these numbers and quickly come up with an answer. They love problem solving and they can solve it fast. Other people want to think a little bit longer about those problems. So you can clearly see the difference between someone who's got a problem solving mentality or problem solving ability and someone who has less than one. And it's not saying that the person who can solve the problems fast is better than the one that can't. It's just that they've developed neural pathways to enable them to make sure that they can develop the route to the answer faster than the other people, faster than the other people. I want to give a quote that was mentioned by Abdul Kalam. He said, you cannot change your future, but you can change your habits. And surely your habits will change your future. 
I'm going to read that again. You cannot change your future, but you can change your habits. Surely your habits will change your future. Now, Money Smart Week, we're talking about how we can better be literate when it comes to finance. That is one aspect of it. But I can give you all the knowledge. And in fact, ladies and gentlemen, let me be bold to say a lot of people coming out of colleges, universities, any institution that has given them training often, sadly, cannot do the work. They've got the theory, but they don't have an understanding of how they apply that work. So I'm going to read the quote again. You cannot change your future, but you can change your habits. And surely your habits will change your future. And there's another, another quote by Jack Canfield from Chicken Soup for the Soul. He said, your habits will determine your future. So think about the dreams that you have. Think about what you're trying to achieve in your life. And how does this link to the financial goal? And I'm going to put a couple of figures up. It's probably going to blow you away in terms of the concept that I'm mentioning. But if we don't rewire our habits, the way that we do things, you're going to continually keep making the same mistakes. So we can have the best financial education, we can have the best financial advisor, but if you as a person have not changed the way that you approach your behavior and approach your habits, you're going to have a bit of a challenge. So what is your dream or your goal? And remember, we always have to have a dream or a goal. And the first question a financial advisor will ask you, where do you want to be in 5, 10, 50, 20, 30 years from now? And they'll push you to understand what type of income you want when you retire, if, in fact, you retire. So think about your dream or your goal. And remember, it's a step-by-step -step process. On my slides, I've written a couple of things down. Complete your schooling might be a goal. Maybe you've had a very really tough school environment where you didn't finish your school. And I've heard of people late into their 40s that eventually complete their school education, their matric certificate, and then go on to achieve two degrees. So maybe it's completing your schooling. Maybe it's obtaining a degree or a diploma. Maybe you want to start a business, write a book, and linking to Money Smart Week, being financially free. I'm going to challenge you this morning. Why not save a million rand, dollars, euros, or pounds? I'm going to say that again. I want to challenge you. How can you save a million rand, million dollars, million euros, or million pounds? You start by defining that goal so clearly. So I want you to imagine a big suitcase, a suitcase that's holding a million rand, dollars, euros, pounds, or whatever. I don't know where you are in the world or what your currency is, but you are classified as a millionaire if you've got a net worth. In other words, after your debt, after all your expenses, you have a million rand available. Then you are a millionaire. And I know some people uh, play around with the idea and say, oh, you're a dollar millionaire in South Africa. We would have to multiply that by the exchange rate, which at the moment hovers between 18 and 19 rand to the dollar. So then do you need 18 million? Forget how much the exact amount is, but let's just say a million. Did you know that the global share of wealth, only 1% of the world's population are millionaires? And this was done in a survey in 2020, where they had a look at those people who, were, who had the availability of 1 million US dollars, 1% of the population. If you look at the wealth share of the world, these guys own 46% of the world's wealth. Almost half the world's wealth is owned by 1% of the population. Middle class own another 11%. That's 100,000 to a million US dollars. Still a very small amount, only 11%. 33% are classified as poor. In other words, 10,000 US to 100,000 US dollars. But this is the scary fact. 55% of the world's population are classified as miserable. In other words, they have less than 10,000 US dollars. Credit Suisse in 2021 did this research. And once again, the poorest people 
have 1% of the world's wealth. The poorest people, the 55%, the miserable people as they classify them, have 1% of the world's wealth. The middle class have about 39% of the world's wealth, but still, only 11% of the population. So I want to introduce this concept, and, and a lot of you would have known it, you would have heard about it, is the concept of SMART, S-M-A-R-T. Now, if you're being smart with your habits and smart with your goals, you can become that millionaire. And remember, I set you the challenge, save a million rand, doro, dollar, euros, or pounds. So how are you going to do that? Well, you have to understand your, your habits, and one of them is discipline. But let's quickly go through the SMART acronym, S-M-A-R-T. S is specific. So if you wanted to set up a dream or a goal, be specific about it, right? What are you trying to do? I want to become a RAND millionaire. That's a million RAND. By the age of 50, That'll, if you take today's terms, a 20-year-old, 30 years will take you to 2053. It's now 20, as I mentioned, so that I'm not dependent on other people. That is the goal. So what is the specific part of that? I want to become a RAND millionaire. M for measurable. How do I measure it? One million. In other words, there's a one and six zeros. Now, that could be a billion. That could be 100,000. It's your goal. I do not want to tell you what your goal should be. Secondly, is it achievable? Well, if you do some mathematical calculation, if you're 20 at the moment, and I'll, I've got a graph which shows this, by saving as little as 500 rand a month, it is achievable to become a millionaire by 50. Is it realistic? Well, he's got 30 years. Now, just to give you some context, 500 rand a month, how much is that per day? 25 rand for 20 working days a month will give you 500 rand. So in the bigger scheme of things, that's not too much. I know a lot of people who spend 25 rand on a cappuccino. In fact, they might even spend 37 rand on a cappuccino. But let's assume you're a 20-year-old, you've just finished school, you, have, you haven't even gone to go and swat, but you are, will learn something. You are doing some odd job. Even the minimum wage, you should be able to put at least 500 rand away. And the last one is time. By when? We've mentioned 2053. So if you take those smart goals, specifically you've said you want to be a millionaire, measurable, how will I know? Well, I'll have a million rand in the bank. Uh, measurable is also by age 50. Is it achievable? Well, you've got 30 years to do it. Is it realistic? You've got to determine whether it's realistic. And then is there time? Now, we've also got to look at your habits as well. I want to mention a, a author which I loved reading the other day. His name is Barclay Palmer or Barclay Palmer. And he wrote a, an article called Six Steps to Becoming a Millionaire. And I'm just going to, it's not my work. I'm just using this as an example. And he gives us six points. First of all, he says, start saving early. So the earlier you start, if you look at some of the wealthiest people in the world, people like Warren Buffett, uh, these guys were started at, at the age, I think it was between 11 or 16, he started delivering newspapers. Start early. Secondly, avoid unnecessary spending and debt. A lot of us work in an environment where we, th we want something, we don't actually need it, all right? So, Avoid unnecessary spending. Yes, we will have to loan money maybe to buy a house. Not everyone has enough money to buy a house up front. But avoid unnecessary spending and debt. His third point is save 15% of your income. Or if you can, save more, but a minimum of 15% of your income. And I'm going to go into each of these points a little bit to, to highlight the impact of smart habits and smart goals. Fourthly, he says make more money. And you say, but Paul, I'm not even making any money. How do I make more money? We're going to have a look at that. Don't give in to lifestyle inflation. A lot of people, the higher their income comes, the more they spend. And finally, he says, get help if you need it. 
Now, I'm a leadership entrepreneur. I use leadership principles to develop entrepreneurs. Now, I'm a leadership entrepreneur. I use leadership principles to develop entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial principles to develop leaders. And people say, Paul, oh, but what is this going to do with finance and Money Smart Week? Well, if we're not able to lead ourselves first, how on earth are we going to lead our families? A bigger team, a small company or a big company? So that's why this is very, very important. That's why I'm passionate about it. So let's go to the first point that Barclay mentioned. He said, start saving early. Now, if you just draw up a simple calculation, and most financial advisors will be able to help do this. At the age of 20, let's say you're earning 500 Rand per month. All right. Well, let's assume that you're earning much more than 500. Let's say maybe 2,500. And let's assume that you can save 500 per month. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter whether it's 100 Rand, 50 Rand or whatever. Get into the discipline of training our brain that mess of neural pathways that we want to develop a strong pathway that we're not taking our car and writing it off. We're taking a bicycle and going on a thin single track and eventually developing a double track and eventually a highway. How do we do that? We start doing a regular thing over and over and over again. So let's have a look at the concept of saving 500 Rand per month. As I mentioned earlier, that is 25 Rand per day. Raise your hand, your virtual hand, if you think that you can put 25 Rand a day away. Now, obviously, if you are living somewhere, you've got to pay living costs, you've got to pay for accommodation, you've got to pay for transport, you've got to pay for food. So obviously, you can't be living on earning 500 Rand. You've got to be able to save something, so a percentage of that. So maybe if this was 10%, you're earning 5,000, but you can take it down to any number that you want. But let's say you save that till you are employed. In other words, you're not working, you're doing odd jobs, you're helping out in a garden, and maybe you're earning two, 3,000 Rand a month. You've been able to save 500. If we do that consistently for 40 years, you will save 240,000 Rand. That's up till the age of 60. Now let's in, uh, look at what is the impact if we put it into an interest-bearing account. And once again, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not giving financial advice. I'm talking about the habits and being specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timed with the goal that you've set. You'll be a millionaire by 57. So just taking that 500 Rand a month, applying 7% interest in an account, you will have a million Rand in the bank by 57. However, that's assuming you are putting money aside only 500 Rand. But let's pick up our game a little bit and say, all right, at 25, I'm now earning some money. I can afford to save 50 Rand a day multiplied by 20 days. So that's a thousand Rand a month. What happens to the calculation? You'll see a trend. We eventually become exponential. So a small increase over here has a big impact on the long run. So 25, you're now saving a thousand rand a month, 7% interest, you'll be a millionaire by 50. Now, most of us, as we develop in our careers, we earn more and more. So five years later, you're now earning enough that you can save 2,000 rand a month. You've doubled your thousand, which was a double of the 500. With 7% compound interest, it's going on each year, we're getting interest, we're plying that money back, we're not drawing anything out. You'll be a millionaire by 45. Let's continue the scenario. 35, you're saving 4,000 Rand a month. 7% compound interest means that you will now have a million by 42. At 40, you're saving 8,000 Rand a month. Remember, I've doubled it every time. 7% interest, you can see you'll be a millionaire by 40. So, ladies and gentlemen, this means that we are changing the way that we look at our habits. We need to make sure that we are looking at what we spend our money on and doing that on a regular basis so that we don't get caught in the trap of not doing any saving. So, we've made a scenario over here. If you continued with the 8,000, you didn't go any higher than 8,000 Rand, and you left that money growing still continuing to 
save 8,000 rand a month, you'll end up with 7.2 million by the age of 60. So if you want to say, I'm half a US millionaire, or close to half, 7 million rand. A lot of that, almost three times, is as a result of compound interest. So if you draw a calculation, and I've done it on Excel, you can see how your contributions grow. You will have 2.6 million with no interest. You've over a 40-year period put money aside on the scale that I've shown you. Each time you increase it, each time you increase it, each time you increase it. What is the impact of interest on that? Well, I've given you the figures, 7.2 million. Remember, there's interest that is being compounded. It's been added every month. You're adding more. It's growing. So you end up with 7.2 million. And I've got a nice graph that shows how we go from starting way at the bottom and eventually it gets steeper and steeper and goes up. Now, I've used a simple example of 500 rand per month. Imagine if you start saving a lot more, deciding that I would rather have money work for me and if you think about it, this is passive income. You're not having to do anything. It's growing because you're reinvesting the profits. Now imagine if your interest rate was 25%. And this has been, if you look at the equity market, the stock exchange, and once again, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just looking at the typical values that have been mentioned on a equity or stock exchange. Bonds are around about 10%. Equity, 25%. I've conservative, conservatively given bonds around about 10%. Equity, 25%. I've conservative, conservatively given you 7%. Imagine if you double that. You pay 7%, your employer pays 7%. Right? You pay 7%, your employer pays 10%. Or maybe you pay 10%, your employer pays 5%. Whatever the ratio, push that up as much as possible. It's not financially savvy information. This is a habit. This is a behavior that you have to learn. But you have to link it to a goal. Because if you don't link it to a goal, you're going to have a challenge because you're not being clear on where you're going. So that was the first point. Start early and do it on a regular basis. And I use the example of 500 Rand. And speak to a financial advisor. Understand the impact. There are lots of calculators and tools on the internet which will provide that. The second point he makes is avoid unnecessary spending and debt. One of the most important things that I learned from my financial advisor is, is it a need or is it a want? We need to eat. We need to drink water. We need to stay in a place that's safe and hopefully warm in winter. We're just coming out of winter here in the Southern Hemisphere. So that's a need. Maybe you want a new car, or maybe you want a car. Maybe you want better clothes. You need clothes, but now you're wanting a little bit better. Our buying is based on our habits, how you grew up, the environment where you grew up. So how making these decisions, your needs or your want, how does that impact your dream? Once again, we've got to be specific. What do you want to do? What do you need to do? Remember the want is the point that's a bit more, let's say, subjective. The need is the important one. So be specific. Is it measurable? If you don't spend that money, what is the impact on your plan, your dream? And if you're taking the money that you would have spent on a want and you push it into your savings, that pushes up your contributions. And as I mentioned earlier, 25 Rand more per day decreases your age of being a millionaire down from 57 to 50. And the same comes to a house, investing in a house. Remember, I mentioned I'm not a financial planner. I'm not here to give you financial advice. But if you're paying your bond off far shorter through the contributions that you're making, you're not paying as much interest and you can pay your house off much faster. But it is a habit, something we have to do on a regular basis. Remember that earlier quote I gave you? Your habits will determine your future. That was Jack Canfield, Chicken Soup for the Soul.
Your habits will determine your future. So what you're doing now is going to have an impact on what you're going to do in the future. You can change that by, most of us can learn to ride a bicycle. So by getting on the bike and riding, it doesn't help but teach you the theory. I'm sure most of us started out maybe, uh, you, you weren't born knowing how to drive a car. The age of 18 in Southern Africa, you start to do a driver's test. Eventually, you build those neurons. You move from the messy you know, environment where it looks like thick, dense bush, and you start building small little single tracks, and then a double track, and then a, a, a road, and then maybe a highway. These are little things that come over time. So we've got to look at those habits and how we can implement them to make sure that we are astute investors through the habit. We're not getting worried about um, where the market is going because we're looking at it every day. We have a habit of maybe looking once a year or trusting a financial advisor, as many people this week probably would have told you and educated you to do. Let's have a look at the third point that was raised by the author Barclay. The third point, he said, is save 15% of your income or more after expenses. Drop your budget and look at what you can save. Consider even 20%. If you've never earned a salary in your life, and you've never had major expenses, what's stopping you from saving up to 30% of your salary? If you're not used to that income coming in, don't get used to the income coming in and living up to your, a standard of living that's higher than what you used to. Take that money and put it aside. The cynical people amongst us will say, but Paul, but why am I saving? The world is going to, excuse the term, hell in a handbasket. The challenge is, without a savings account, you don't have the freedom to make all sorts of choices. So you can choose to live out all your money, but then not have a fund or a bucket or a nest egg to help you out of a crisis situation. Guys, I'm 56 years old and I'm talking from experience. I went through a retrenchment. We didn't have enough money at that stage to do the things that we wanted to do. So I've learned these things the hard way. We had to sell our house. We had to rent. All sorts of changes. I am doing this because I want to empower you to make the right decision. But remember, it's all based on habits, on the neural pathways that we develop as we're growing. So I encourage you. Save 15% of your income, as Barclay suggests as well. So if you look at, I mentioned a little bit earlier, the employees saving 7.5% of, of their salary. And then if you link to an employer, ask them as part of a retirement scheme to also save 7.5%. 15% of your salary goes into savings. Think about that. My calculations earlier were based on 7%. Starting at 500,000, 500 rand, sorry, correction, starting at 500 rand, doubling that every five years, up to 8,000 rand a year, you can end up with 7.2 million. Imagine what happens if the return goes from 7% an annum to 15%. So your contribution, you're contributing 15%, and the market is growing at 15%. Major, major leverage there. My calculation was only about 7%. The fourth point, make more money. Yeah, people say, Paul, that's, you know, it's easy for you to say, just make more money. I've seen, and I also got an increase based on the fact that I asked. I was doing more work in the organization. So I went to them and said, yeah, th this, I, I really am doing this. I'm adding this. Is there a possibility that I can get an increase? And most of the time, I got to know. But every now and again, they said, but oh, we see that you are adding some value. We'll be able to give you a few percent increase. Don't ask. You don't get. Some of us can work extra hours. If you don't have a family that you're looking after, you're on your own, you can work extra hours. And if you work overtime, you even have the bonus of earning an overtime salary. Here's an interesting concept, and I learned it many years back with the Chinese. They would have three jobs. They'd have a job in the morning selling newspapers. They'd go and work their job. And then in the afternoon, they'd come and do another job. So they had three jobs that they would do before work, during the formal work, and after work. 
And you look how that economy has grown. It's slowed down in the last couple of decades, but at one stage it was really cooking. And people were increasing their, their living standards, increasing the way that they did things. And we see a transformed economy. Remember, with more money available, it drives other businesses. So it's a whole ecosystem. Now, this is not an economics course, and I'm not an economics professor, but if you go look at the concept of scarcity and, and demand, how pricing is impacted, but the bottom line is that money makes things happen. So the more money in a community, the more money that community can spend. The more money the community can spend, the better the facilities, the better the facilities, the more skills, and, and so it goes on. So you uplift an environment. And that touches on the entrepreneurship work, work that I do. Because I want to encourage entrepreneurs and I encourage normal people. I say normal people. You don't really get normal people. But I want to encourage every citizen to consider starting their own business. Not everyone does it. Not, not everyone can. But imagine starting their own business. Not everyone does it. Not, not everyone can. But imagine if we had more entrepreneurs driving their businesses, we would have a situation where there would be much more money available in our communities. So instead of doing a second job, once again, we're being specific, we're being measurable. Is it achievable? Is it realistic? And is it timed? You may even consider doing some more training because once you are trained and you've got more qualifications, you have more knowledge. And if you can apply that knowledge, people will pay you more. Let's go to point number five. Don't give in to lifestyle inflation. We all fall into this trap at some stage. We're earning more. We think, oh, I can buy that bigger car. Oh, I need a bigger house. Is it a need or is it a want? So as we're earning more money, we want to spend more money. Ideally, if you're earning more money, you have more money to save. So now you have to say, what am I going to do? Am I going to perhaps spend a little bit or to improve my living standard, but save more? Because once again, if you get money that's working for you, it's a passive income rather than having to be reliant on other people. And that's why a big focus is on, on, on the, the government making sure that we don't have too many pension, too many pensioners drawing a salary. They're working on all sorts of schemes to make sure that some of us, or most of us at least, are on some form of pension. Uh, don't quote me on this, but the numbers that I've heard is something like only 6% of the working population can afford to retire comfortably. 6% of the working population. And remember, we've got a very low working population in terms of that, because unemployment, last time I heard, was between uh, unemployment of 40% round right about there. Guys, this is a challenge. We need to make sure that we are preparing for the time where there is no income. I'll encourage you also to focus on your goal. What did you want to save money for? Was it for that million? Was it to write the book? What was it? What was, it? What was the goal? Because that goal will help focus you. This is a very tender subject, Brisson, because a lot of us compare ourselves to what the media wants us to be. Are you trying to keep up with the people around you? They may not have the same qualifications as you. They may not have the same disposable income as you. They may not, there are so many different things. Don't keep up with those around you. You think you're impressing them, but you're actually depressing yourself. And sometimes they couldn't really care. If you say, oh, look at the new car I've got. Great for the first couple of hours. Smell the nice smells. And it gets dirty at the end of the week. You have to have it washed and eventually has mechanical issues. So why do you want to go and impress other people? They're really not interested. I would also suggest, as we look at the lifestyle inflation, is to surround yourself with great people. I think it was John Maxwell that said, surround yourself with five people. And those five people will determine how you, your living standard, how your earning, how your studies will be impacted. If you surround yourself with five great people, you'll end up being like one of them. Surround yourself with people that always have issues, that are sucking energy, drawing stuff from you, you know, wanting to loan money the whole time from you, and you'll find yourself defaulting to the lowest common denominator. Barclay's sixth point is to get help 
if you need it. Now, as a male, it's, it's one of the challenges I think males have is we don't want to ask for help. First of all, you say, help, people think you are helpless. Don't be scared to ask for help. And I'm not only linking it to financial advice, emotional advice, help with your marriage, help with relationships, help with work, help with anything that you're busy with. We cannot all do it ourselves. I would encourage you to stick to what you're good at. I love presenting. I love lecturing. I love teaching. I love coaching. I'm not a financial advisor. I have a financial advisor that advises me and I have a good relationship with him. I know where my limit is and I should not move above that limit and always trying to do something and say, oh, I can do it cheaply. The challenge is you're not going to do it as well. So pay a professional to do this. And if you are not paying a person who is professionally qualified, you know that they understand the market, watch out where you're putting your money. Get someone who will be able to add value to you and that you have a good relationship with. They need to understand what your goal is so that they can make that goal realistic. This is something which I saw on Last Money Smart Week South Africa. Beware of quick get rich schemes. Wealth is not what you show in terms of the watch, the clothes, the car, the house you drive. Wealth is in your bank account. And often many people don't see that. People tend to want to live and show their wealth. So they want to make money fast. They get involved with, I'm not going to mention names, an ABC scheme, an XYZ scheme, and they say, oh, the return on this is phenomenal. But remember, often if it's too good, looks too good to be true, it is. Be very careful on what they are promising you. And some of the returns are 10, 15% per month. How is that possible if the, the stock exchange has only returned 25% over a prolonged period, a year, and you are getting 100% return on your investment a year? How is it that they are able to outperform a market that's been around for hundreds of years? And the best help that I can suggest is set up that budget. How much is coming in? How much is going out? I want to mention a second. Hopefully this is making sense to you guys because, as I said, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just using common sense in what I see with my coaches, the coaches I'm working with, what I see in lectures, what I see in an environment when I'm working with a lot of entrepreneurs. Simple things which we don't do, we're not consistent with. We're not following what you call smart habits, S. M-A-R-T. I want to give you another example. Second goal. Imagine your goal is to run an ultra marathon. In South Africa, we have a couple, but let's talk about the either the two oceans or the comrades. That's an ultra mar marathon. Half marathon, 21 kilometers, marathon 42. An ultra marathon is obviously anything above that. How do you start that process? I'm not too sure why you want to run or whatever you want to do. That is your choice. Many people want to do it because they want to prove to themselves that they can do it. And it's a lifetime experience. A lot of people who do it and vow never to do it while they're running within a week have signed up for the next year. But let's use this as a goal too. The first goal we mentioned was the million. The second goal, run an ultra marathon. How do you start? Bruce Fordyce, when he brought a park run to South Africa, was amazed at how people would work together and support each other when running small distances. And we've seen, and I speak under correction, but it's something like over a million people every weekend that are running in a park run. Some are walking. Some are walking with their dogs. Some are ultra competitive. Some are just getting their heart rates up. So if you're running an ultra marathon, what is the habit that we have to do initially? Get into the habit of walking a five kilometer park run. What are we doing? We're taking this math, this sort of mess of forest in your brain and saying, but I don't have the habit to run or to walk. 
We're now carving a pathway, a single track through, so that we can start traveling that road. As soon as we start traveling that road, we build the habit, we build on the habit. So maybe you walk to five kilometer park road. Next, you run the five kilometer park run. You're exhausted at the end, but you feel good. There's dopamine release. This is, oh, this is so great. You can't wait for the next week. You can't even wait for 12 o'clock to come to have a look at your results and say, oh, did I do better than last time? You couldn't really care about the other people around you. This is competing with yourself. Go back to my million story. Are you wanting to collect a million to prove to others that you've got a million? Or are you wanting to prove to yourself that you can actually save a million rand. So let's go back to our running our ultra marathon story. You've walked the five run, five kilometer park run. You've run a five kilometer park run. Now you say, I want to complete that five kilometers in 40 minutes. It's doable. Eventually you say, let's bring it down to 41. Sorry, the 40 minutes down to 39, 38, 37, 30. And if you think of how you're going to complete 21 kilometers, a half marathon, how long is it going to take you within the time? Where are you going? What is your goal? Are you specific? Are you measuring it? Is it achievable? Are you measuring it? Is it achievable? Is it realistic? And how do you know when you've achieved it? Time. Can you see the similarity? We are going on a run. We're looking at an environment where we are moving from no habit or little habit to an environment where there are massive, strong, active habits. And look at people who started humbly running a park run. There are many of them that have completed an ultra marathon. So let me just, as we start to wrap up, remind you of, of what happens in our brain when we're doing things. If you're not used to doing something, we have a very weak neural pathway. Our aim is to make sure that if we try to achieve the goal, that neural pathway is developed. And I always love the example of a baby eating. A baby, when they start feeding themselves, don't know where to put the spoon. And in fact, it goes all over the place. And I've raised two children and... It's been quite hilarious when you look at the amount of mess on the floor and on you and on them, the end of the process, until they get it into their mouth, until they taste it. Their muscles say, but this is, this is a good practice. That is really good. Sometimes it doesn't taste nice. The neural pathways are not used to the texture that they're eating. So maybe they spit it out until they've had it a few times. Many of you, if I put you on baby food, you'll probably spit it out now. But you're on more, let's say, mature food. But a neural pathway has been developed. In fact, many of us have not stopped eating. We eat too much. But that's a point for another day. But your neural pathways have been developed. They're growing and they're getting bigger and bigger. And the more disciplined we are and the more feedback we get on seeing, oh, I've been able to save this amount of money. If we, we go back to the time we'll be saving from 500 rand to 1,000 to 2,000 to 4,000 to 8,000. Every time you get that statement and you can see how that money is improving and it's being saved or your times are improving as you're doing the marathon, what's happening to your neural pathway? What's happening to your habits? It's strengthening. Your habits are strengthening. And as they strengthen, you do them much easier. And our aim is to make sure that we've got good neural pathways in the areas where we want to operate. Now, not everyone will have strong pathways for things like discipline or innovation and stuff like that. There's nothing wrong with that. I mentioned the problem solving earlier. But just find what you want to do and link it to something where you have a strong neural pathway. I go back to that quote which I mentioned earlier. Your habits will determine your future. So what you do today will have an impact. So as we wrap this up, I want to remind you, look at what you're doing in terms of your money. Look at how you're spending it. Look at how you can change your lifestyle. Look at how you can change the things around you to make sure that you operate in an environment where you're not influenced by other people. 
And were you saving the million? Were you running the race? Little steps, one at a time, will bring you to your goal. And that way, you will then have smart habits. So in this Money Smart Week, remember to be specific, whatever you do. Specific is terrific. Measurable. What are you trying to do? Is it 21 kilometers? Is it 42 kilometers? Is it 100 kilometers? Is it achievable? If you have not been running and you suddenly want to start park running and you want to do it in 25 minutes, it's not achievable. Look at moving your goal or setting the time that you're going to achieve it. Is it realistic? Can you put the time in to save the money? Can you put the time in to do the training so that you are fit to run the ultra marathon? And always make sure that it's time. When will this be achieved? When will I achieve my million? By the age of 50, 57, 60, or 40. But then have a plan. Link it to the neural pathways in your brain so that you understand your habits and make sure that you're being smart about the way that you're running your habits. My name is Paul Tanton. I am a leadership entrepreneur. I love working with new entrepreneurs. I love working with people who understand a little bit about leadership and want to go to the next level. My company is Uvita, where we craft leaders. And if you want to contact me in any aspect around leadership or entrepreneurship or habits, as I've mentioned, I have a number of tools which I use, and I would love to engage with you guys. My telephone number is on the screen, 072 778 1059. I'll mention again 072 778 1059. And my email address is paul, P A U L, at uvita.co.za. I trust this talk has helped you in terms of the last 50 minutes that we've been working together. Encourage yourself daily by sticking to something because you know the goal. And once you start doing that, you not only change yourself, you can change your family. You can ultimately start changing your community. You can start changing your continent. And hopefully, we'll be able to change the world. So thank you very much for watching this live broadcast. And I trust that you've, you've had a great time. You'll learn. Please make sure that you engage with the other platforms that are running this week. Uh, the, a lot of them will be recorded. Review them. Have a look at what happened last year. But change the way that you engage with your money, your body, the way things happen. Because that way, we can make a great difference. So link up with me. It'd be great to chat. And I'm going to end the stream. If you've got any questions, you can post them to me in WhatsApp on my telephone number 072 778 1059. 072 778 1059. Have a great day and enjoy Money Smart Week 2023.